This weekend, I had the privilege of watching a very early screening of Asteroid City at the Austin Film Society. But I didn't just watch that film. Over the last couple days, there was a whole program of movies that inspired Wes Anderson's latest feature, such as On the Waterfront, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and The Misfits. It was fantastic to see these movies on the big screen. The final scene of On the Waterfront is just so much more powerful in the cinema. And regarding Close Encounters, you've got to watch Douglas Trumbull's effects on the biggest screen possible. But getting back to the film that you all want to hear me talk about, Asteroid City. I'll keep this review fairly spoiler free, but you know what? I honestly don't know how you can spoil this movie. This film might be Wes Anderson's least plot focused film in quite some time. The French Dispatch, Isle of Dogs, The Grand Budapest Hotel, Moonrise Kingdom, and Fantastic Mr. Fox all had adventure, intrigue, action, and fast paced intricate plots. Not Asteroid City though. Almost the whole film takes place in one small desert town where junior stargazers gather to show off their new space age era inventions and observe an eclipse. But their plans for a mundane get together go awry when an alien visits them, prompting the military to quarantine the tourists for a week. How long can they keep us in Asteroid City? Legally, I mean. Well, I'm not an attorney, but I'd say as long as they like. And so, this movie functions kind of like a Wes Anderson version of a hangout film. The characters all pass the time by playing games, taking photos, drinking, rehearsing scenes, trying to break quarantine, and getting to know each other. The alien visitation throws many of them into existential crises, and everyone tries to figure out just how to return to normalcy in light of this new knowledge. But the main theme of the film is grief and religion. Before the beginning of the movie, Augie Steenbeck's wife passes away, but he waits to tell his kids until they're in Asteroid City. His father-in-law, Stanley Zack, drives out to pick up his kids and him, and as a result, gets caught up in the quarantine. Forced to stay together, Zack and Steenbeck's shared grief allows them to work through their differences and general distaste for each other so that they can figure out just how to move on as a family. With their pairing comes a dialectic of atheism and theism, with Steenbeck being a staunch atheist and Zack a committed Episcopalian. There are questions of where do people go after they die? The stars? The ground? Heaven? The arrival of the alien just makes everything so much more complicated. So there is extraterrestrial life out there. What do they want with us? How little do we actually know? I find it funny that this film is releasing right after those reports of UFOs and contact with ETs just released to the public. Thanks a lot, Ricky. I don't know what to say, General Gibson. I'm don't sorry. Don't apologize, Dad. The public has a right to the truth. You made your point. This tribunal is a mockery! The main stars of Asteroid City are definitely Jason Schwartzman, Jake Ryan, Scarlett Johansson, Brian Cranston, and maybe, to a lesser extent, Tom Hanks. But I would argue that this is Jason's picture, and it's his first starring role he's had in a Wes Anderson movie since The Darjeeling Limited, despite having worked with Wes Anderson extensively behind the scenes since that film released, as he was a writer for Isle of Dogs and he helped develop the story for The French Dispatch. His character of Augie Steenbeck reminds me of a young Kubrick. He has the Kubrick beard and he's always wearing a camera around his neck, taking great photos during the film that look like they could have been featured in, say, Life magazine. What are you going to do with that? That picture? Huh. Well, if it's any good, I guess I'll try to sell it to a magazine, now that you mention it. The other characters and events in the film are also inspired by real life people, movies, or they feel like love letters to certain archetypes found in film or the stage during the mid 20th century. The beeps and music from the alien is straight out of Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Also, Scarlett Johansson's Midge Campbell is like a mashup of Marilyn Monroe, Grace Kelly, and Kim Novak. Rupert Friends Montana, the singing cowboy, feels heavily inspired by Montgomery Clift, Marlon Brando, Paul Newman, and a bunch others. Adrian Brody's character of Schubert Green felt to me like a mix of Arthur Miller, Sidney Lumet, and Elliot Kazan, and Ed Norton's Conrad Earp is definitely inspired by Tennessee Williams and Truman Capote. And that leads me to what the film actually is. You might have read interviews from the Cannes Film Festival, or you might have picked up the book Do Not Detonate Without Presidential Approval, which I might add, is a very fun read and it has a lot of cool little essays, interviews, journal entries, and the like in it. But if you've done any research into the film other than just watch the trailer, you would know that the trailers are kind of lying to you. The film is not about Asteroid City. The film is about a cast of actors in New York City circa the 1950s putting on the play Asteroid City, with Wes framing the film as a whole as a documentary on this actor's studio inspired troupe. The parts outside the play are shot in 4x3 black and white, with Brian Cranston serving as the documentary's host and narrator. It gives you the feeling that you're watching an old television program that might have aired on CBS or something. 
The play is shown to us in colorful widescreen, which had me thinking about what Wes was going for. It feels like a quasi-Spielbergian adaptation of a play, but I'm inclined to believe that it's the actors and the audience's imagined world. All the props and stage decorations are there, sure, but we feel like we're really there in Asteroid City, not like we're in a theater in New York. This triple-layered approach to his film allows Wes to play around with form, especially with the New York set story as he tells that fairly non-chronologically. He even pokes fun at the form and tells some meta-jokes within the movie. We see a lot of what happens in the play, but we see some scenes played out in rehearsals or auditions. I find it really interesting to see Wes experimenting with storytelling in this way. The framing device also gives me a lot of respect for the actors in this movie, as the actors are playing as 1950s New York theater actors who are playing as characters in a play. They all have to act as two different people at the same time. I would also place this film in a kind of unofficial trilogy of Wes Anderson movies. That is, movies that are adaptations of fictional works of art. With The Grand Budapest Hotel, he based a story on a fictional novel written by a character inspired by Stefan Zweig. In The French Dispatch, the short stories are adaptations of fictional New Yorker style pieces. And in Asteroid City, the film is an adaptation of a fictional play. I know that Wes Anderson framed the Royal Tenenbaums as an adaptation of a book of the same name, but in these three movies he uses aspect ratio, color, and chronology to really bring those framing devices into focus. But with Asteroid City, as much as it's about grief, the space age, the actor studio, religion, and the films from that era, I think that maybe above all, it's about Wes Anderson himself. It's probably his most self-reflective movie since Rushmore. But if Rushmore was a film about the adolescence of Wes Anderson and Owen Wilson, Asteroid City is a movie about Wes Anderson as a director. People think that he's not self-aware about his style, but I think that this film proves that he probably is. Also, about his style, his shots are not all symmetrical, and all those AI-generated Wes Anderson movie trailers are just terrible. They seriously missed a mark on his trademarks, beginning with his titles. Like, they're called The Galactic Menagerie or The Whimsical Fellowship. Name one of his movies that are titled like those parodies. The closest you'll find is Fantastic Mr. Fox, which is the name of the book he adapted, and maybe The Royal Tenenbaums, which is just the name of the main character. His titles are very direct and are usually just locations like Asteroid City, Moonrise Kingdom, Isle of Dogs, and the Grand Budapest Hotel. Okay, I don't want to descend into a rant. What I'll say as a closing statement is that if you're not a fan of Wes Anderson, this movie won't change your mind. It's slower than some of his latest fare, but I enjoyed how he really lets this movie breathe. It's a pretty comfy film with space-age aesthetics, depressed adults, and really funny kids. The side characters are all interesting and pretty funny, with Steve Carell and Matt Dillon standing out to me as some of the funniest of the smaller roles. There's even a musical number that almost had the whole audience square dancing. And, of course, it's filled with all the artifice you might expect from his movies from painted backdrops to stop-motion animation. Maybe even more so, considering how he frames the whole thing. I'll be seeing this movie again when it officially releases, so maybe I'll do a live stream after you guys have seen it, and I can go into a bit more depth. Oh, one last thing. This is the first Wes Anderson movie since Rushmore that Bill Murray is not in. I kept looking for him, but he never showed up, which was a bit disappointing. I wondered if it was because of his cancellation, but According to The Hollywood Reporter, the reason was that Murray got COVID right as production was starting and so he couldn't go to Spain, where they shot the film, in time for his role. Anyways guys, I hope that these first thoughts and reactions helped you in determining whether or not you want to see the film. I had a fun time watching it, but I don't think it's my favorite film of his. That title might still go to Rushmore or the Grand Budapest Hotel. Asteroid City though, as it is, might be his smallest film in a while despite the large cast of A-list talent. Still. I'd like to see him do another film that doesn't focus on a large ensemble cast. Something like Rushmore. Maybe my opinion will change after a second viewing, but who knows? If you've seen it, let me know what you think about it. And as always, I've been the Kino Corner, and I will see you all in the next video.